It is my pleasure to introduce to you to Pedro Fortuna. Thank you all. Um, welcome. Um, thank you for being here. Uh, today I'll be uh, talking about protecting crypto exchanges from a new wave of men in the browser attacks. Starting with a, bit, a little bit about me. Um, so I've worked in security for the last 15 years. Um, the, the last seven or eight have been mostly focused in uh, JavaScript code protection. Uh, but before I started working in the network security side of things, then I started building things like bot detection, device fingerprinting. And in the, in the last few years, I've also paid a lot of attention to many in the browser attacks and uh, malicious extensions. So today's talk will be mostly about many in the browser and crypto exchanges. Uh, but I'll start off by, by uh, a brief um, overview of the man in the browser uh, history, then followed by, uh, I'll cover uh, the most common security, application security features that uh, we have found in crypto exchanges. Then we'll get deep into uh, the attacks that we have uh, seen in last March. And uh, at the end, I will talk about application real-time monitoring, which is a kind of a new approach that we have been uh, working on that can help in this type of attacks. So for those who are not familiar with man in the browser, it all starts with a, a device getting affected, usually through um, email phishing. Uh, it's the mo most common way of doing it. And, and, and then the, the, the Trojan gains control of the browser and just wait, waves off for the user to go to a certain targeted website and it, then it uh, makes malicious injections into the page and tampers with the page. And this happens regardless of other authentication factors that may be in use. So many in the browser can be subtle. So they can be patient. They will just wait for you to access the website. And then they, they, they may wait for the very last minute to change like a transaction or just to collect your credentials. So it's, uh, it's, um, they do the very minimum to accomplish what they want to do in the website. And they can be very subtle. Uh, not all the time they will produce something that's visible, like it gets rendered differently. So it's very hard. So in this, in this example that you see, what's happening is uh, the web inject is modifying the, the transfer amount and destination account. Uh, but apart from that, that's not the, 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 through the perspective of the server, that's, uh, you have nothing else to look and that can tell you that this is happening. So it's uh, really an attack focused on the client side and it's hard to spot. So it all started with Zeus, not the slot machine, but the Trojan. Uh, it first appeared in 2007, um, and he was able to, to do web injects and also to, form, to, to do form grabbing. And at the bottom, you can see how a web inject looks like. So it has three sections, uh, the target URL, uh, a reference where to inject, and the injection itself. So in this example, uh, the web inject is adding um, a field to a form that's requesting an ATM pin from the user. So the source code for Zeus was released or leaked uh, back in 2011, and this really opened the door for uh, the number of attacks growing. We have seen a lot of uh, different uh, forks and uh, uh, variants of Zeus, and they are still out there. In this table, you can see uh, the most common features that you can find in the Man in the Browser Trojan. So most of them have form grabbing and web injection. Of course, they, those are uh, practically mandatory. But they can do other things like key logging, remote access, or, uh, and a few of them are even able to remove uh, HTTP headers, which can be really dangerous. So back in 
2016, according to a study by IBM, uh, the most prevalent, uh, many of the browser Trojans, were still Zeus, which is surprising. After 10 years, it's uh, the most prevalent one, and followed by uh, a couple of variants, NeverQuest and Gozi. Uh, but you can see here that uh, the attacks have been going on uh, in the last 10 or 12 years. Um, and really, we are just scratching the surface. So there's so many attacks that go unnoticed. Uh, but we don't have time to cover all of this today. So I'll just mention one. Back in 2015, uh, a Drydex train was able to steal uh, around $50 million. And what wor was worse is that it took two whole months for anyone I mean, and, and we're talking about hundreds of different financial institutions for anyone to notice that this was happening. So this is a real problem. The question is, how secure are crypto exchanges? Um, are they up to the task? Uh, what kind of features they have that can mitigate or prevent this? This is what the question that we had. So we went for um, a few exchanges to find out what they were doing. But there's too many exchanges. Um, I think the, the numbers I saw was roughly over 200 crypto exchanges right now. And so it's too many to, to make a survey. So we had to start somewhere. And we decided to choose a representative set. Um, and, uh, and the rule of thumb was uh, let's select exchanges that are likely to be selected by uh, users. So we went for the, the most popular, but not only the most popular, but the ones that have also interesting features that we know about. So trading volume is interesting, ranking on Google search, uh, links in relevant sites and social media, and also known user base. So in the end, we selected this six Binance, Bitfinex, Bitrex, Coinbase, Huobi, and Kraken. So other exchanges could, be, could have been selected, of course. Um, but I believe the, the main conclusions wouldn't be different. So getting into the features, um, by now everyone knows what two-factor authentication is. It's, uh, can be used to first-rate attacks that only compromise a single channel. So you have a second one. Uh, you can use SMS. You can use uh, mobile applications like Google Authenticator or even physical uh, hardware like uh, FIDO. Uh, all exchanges that we, we saw use uh, two-factor authentication, uh, but they differ uh, when they force the use of two-factor authentication. So in general, they can use this uh, to confirm logins, withdrawals, password changes, API key creation, changing security settings, or changing other sensitive uh, settings. CAPTCHAs are also very common. Um, they are used to determine if the navigation is being done by a human or by a bot. And you have uh, many different types of CAPTCHAs. Uh, the early day CAPTCHAs were all based in text, as you can see in the, in the right, the top image. Uh, then the image-based CAPTCHAs uh, came along and become very prevalent. And uh, in, in the last few years, we are seeing more risk-based uh, and hybrid or dynamic-based uh, CAPTCHAs that uh, basically collect behavior information of the navigation and decide whether they should allow you in or just serve you an image-based capture if they are suspicious that uh, you, are, you may be a bot. So typically, they are used in authentication and registration. And uh, most of the, the exchanges that we analyze uh, are already using uh, reCAPTCHA, which is the, the latter type of uh, CAPTCHA, risk-based. But what you have to, to keep in mind is that um, there's a, a, a high threat, which is the use of sweatshops to solve CAPTCHAs. So especially if you are using image-based CAPTCHAs or even text, with text-based CAPTCHAs, you don't even need uh, sweatshops. But if you are using image-based uh, CAPTCHAs, 
uh, there's a whole set of services that you can easily integrate with your automation tools to attack that can get you solved any captcha in just a few seconds. And you can scale that up and you can abuse uh, many websites that are only protected by image-based captchas. So you have to watch out for those. Exchanges also lay out a number of different account takeover defenses, uh, starting with two-factor authentication, of course, um, but they are only forced by a couple. So only Binance and Bitfinex really force you to use two-factor authentication. So in, in the other cases, you can disable this option so it becomes a viable um, road for an attacker to disable those options and try to attack. So another thing is that they send an email uh, on every successful login. So this is useful because if you receive an email and you haven't logged in, maybe you should take measures, right? Um, if you reset your password or two-factor authentication, some of those will require you to, to confirm that action through an email they sent you. And in a few cases, that will all, uh, also cause your account to be frozen for a certain amount of time. So you cannot do withdrawals if you just reset your password or two-factor authentication. Uh, and this is good. You can also uh, have a, a whitelist of IP addresses and devices. Um, so you always have to confirm uh, new devices. So not, not all exchanges have offer this and, and in some situations you have to approve as well uh, through email. Um, some ca in some cases there's al also the possibility of freezing your account directly uh, using the emails that you received which is good because if you receive an email telling you about some action uh, you can quickly disable your account and hopefully in time for stopping the funds from being exfiltrated from your account. And all exchanges in general, they collect, um, they lock uh, your, the actions that you do, and they make this information available to you so you can spot if uh, weird things have been done with your account. Withdrawal protections are probably the category that uh, I found more interesting uh, because some of the features can really be helpful to protecting exchanges. For instance, uh, if you reset your passwords or two-factor authentication, like I said, uh, your account can be frozen for a certain amount of time, and that amount of time can go from 24 hours to 15 days, which is really aggressive, but gives enough time for people to understand if uh, someone is messing with your password or with your two-factor authentication. And this amount of time in certain situations depends on the, the exchange and the amount of funds that you wish to transfer. You can also lock or disable withdrawals for crypto coins that you are not using and you, not, you don't wish to trade at all. And you also have a withdrawal address whitelist. So you need to specify um, the, the, the crypto wallet exchange, uh, addresses that you intend to do transfers to. And if you need to add a new address that can cause your, your account to be frozen during, for instance, five days. And, um, and, but the problem is some exchanges, they let you disable this feature. And they let you disable without requesting a two-factor authentication token. So this is a weak spot for sure. Also, the IP device whitelist uh, lets you uh, withdraw for new IPs and new devices, but only if they were previously approved. And you have a minimum of uh, 24 hours, uh, commonly, that you need to wait before they are really approved and, and, and cleared out to use. Uh, also, uh, as you can see in the, in the screen at the right, the image, some exchanges also present this image with the transaction details, but also with the secret phrase that you can set, and this is done to prevent things like phishing attacks or tampering attacks that are uh, forging uh, transactions or tricking you and, and diverting the funds to other accounts. So if you don't find your secret phrase there, maybe it's an automated tampering attack and you need to watch out for those. 
Uh, there's also some anti-phishing, more anti-phishing uh, uh, techniques. Um, you can set a secret phrase that's sent in every email that you receive to prevent email phishing. And you can also configure, I think in, uh, in a couple of exchanges, uh, uh, PGP keys to, to be able to, to receive the encrypted emails. So this is useful as well. Uh, pretty much all of them use HTTPS by now. And uh, I think uh, only Binance, no, a couple of them, uh, they, they show you uh, warnings uh, or requests for you to check and double check if you are running in the HTTPS and if you get the green lock and everything uh, to make sure that you pay attention to those things. Last but not least, content security policy. Um, so after going through all the six exchanges, um, I'm kind of disappointed because um, what I saw is most of the exchanges are not using, are either not using CSP at all or they are using it uh, very wrongly. So as, as, um, as a couple of friends of mine, Michele and uh, Lucas from Google said, and they speak about CSP a lot, um, over 94% of all CSPs based in wirelists are bypassable. So you shouldn't use them at all. Oh, oops. <laughs> um, and, uh, and what I saw is that um, at least more than half of these uh, exchanges, they are using whitelisted domains in CSP, which they shouldn't do at all. And plus, they use unsafe eval, they use unsafe inline, and they, no, they don't use base URI none. And, and like I said, some don't even use CSP at all. So th they practically do all the mistakes that you can do with CSP. I don't know the reasons, but I, know, I, I think they should uh, fix this. Uh, CSP should be used, but should be used right. And I really can't recommend enough the use of CSP Evaluator, which is a, a tool from Google uh, that can warn you off if you are doing like, obvious mistakes in your CSP configuration. So in this table, you can see a summary of most of what we already talked about. Um, also, I include um, uh, the X-frame options that uh, we have found in these exchanges. And the general overview is that most of them are allowing iframing of their website from their own domain. And as we are going to see, this is a problem. So only kind moment is uh, denying iframing from within their website. Uh, other things that you can see, the two-factor authentication, uh, in, in the case of uh, Binance and Bitfinex, they are being forced in a lot of, a lot of the actions that you can do. In the, in the remaining four, uh, you can disable two-factor authentication, and, uh, and this is bad because uh, uh, many in the browser can exploit this by disabling the, the, the requesting two-factor authentication, and, and uh, so it becomes a, a useless uh, a security feature. And this is the same table um, with uh, the positive, positive things and negative things. And I believe this table should be way greener than actually it is. And there's no single exchange that can get away because let's say Bitfinex is way greener than the others, but at the same time, they are not using CSP. So they should be blocking all sorts of cross-site scripting, uh, disabling framing from within their, their websites, so no one gets out easily from, from this. So the main takeaways is that improvements can be made. CSP is not being used properly. Um, in one case, I didn't point out that Bitfinex is using text-based captchas, which are very used to overcome if using OCR or whatever. Uh, you should ban framing from the, f f of the website from within, uh, which is also useful to mitigate uh, attacks like click checking. Uh, so you get that as a bonus. So there's no reason why you shouldn't use CSP. 
And every important action should trigger two-factor authentication, and that can't be disabled. So you can't let the user decide whether uh, two-factor authentication should be used or not. So all sorts of whitelists can help. Uh, they, they should be used, but they should be forcefully used with freeze time, like freeze time. And uh, the anti-phishing tamper-proof images are also good to, to, to fight bots. But some of the stuff were nailed down by the exchanges, so they all use H. Yeah. Uh, they, they all use factor. One, two, okay. Factor authentication. They all they all log your history. Wait a second. But um, but if you look at what's being done, we are using a lot of two-factor authentication captures, countries, whitelists, this and that, and the overall usability is being hurt. So what we want to know is whether we are gaining more security in return by doing all of this. So now I will show you the, I will talk about the attacks. So f roughly five months ago, um, I heard in the news that uh, Coinbase and uh, um, blockchain.info were being targeted by many of the browser attacks. And it all started by the work of uh, a couple of malware researchers, uh, Doina Kozovan and Kathleen Valerio Lita from Security Scorecard. So they did a white paper on this. And basically, uh, what they found is uh, this was an attack caused by Zeus Panda, which is a variant of Zeus. And they were targeting. Um, so, what, what stood out from this is that among 50 targets, we found two crypto exchanges. And this really caught my attention. So I've, I've read the white paper carefully, and this is what you can see there. So this is the first stage web inject. I don't know, maybe you cannot read this, but uh, it has a div element on, in the top, and then you have an inline script. Hello, use of CSP, please. And here you can see an, the obfuscated uh, uh, version of the same script. It's not really complete, but you can see the different parts. But basically what it's doing is just waiting out for the page to complete loading, and then afterwards it's just uh, dumping an inline script that will load a second stage JavaScript payload from the website. So this means that the attacker can change the attack at any given point. So the only thing that's static is the web inject. So you put the, web, the man in the browser out there, is uh, injecting when people visit the websites, but then at, at that moment, they will dynamically load a second stage JavaScript payload, and that can evolve. They can, can do different things through, through time. So in this case, it's only doing that, and we, we didn't have we didn't have all the details, so we did, with the white paper, you didn't have access to all the second stage payload. So, and we wanted more, more details on this. So we reached out to Doina and Kathleen, and we were able to discuss the, the attack with them, and they were kind enough to share the, the, the stage two payload with us. And based on that, we implemented for Coinbase.com uh, a C2 capable of interacting with the JavaScript payload, and we are doing the injections uh, in the browser uh, using Burp proxy. So this is what we know. So initially the user visits Coinbase. Uh, at any given page, the web inject is always injected, no matter what inner URL you are visiting. And uh, when you access the login form, uh, they overlay, they, they, they put a button over the real button, and they disable the enter key so that you cannot use that because that will, would trigger the, uh, the bottom real button. And they force you to click their own button. So it's kind of an uh, easy trick they can do. 
Um, so when you log in, they will exfiltrate your credentials, but they will also uh, uh, put forward the normal login. So after log you log in uh, at the dashboard, they will present you with uh, this model window that says that uh, they detected unusual sign-in act activity. You're probably trying to log from a new location or device. And uh, so it seems pretty generic. So it could potentially warn you off. But at the same time, who knows when the crypto exchanges are requesting two-factor authentication? It's really complex and it's dynamic too, so we never know what's their strategy for serving and requesting two-factor authentication. So at the same time, this can easily trick people into entering the, the two-factor authentication uh, credentials. So let's imagine that you enter it and uh, when you do that, they will basically use that credential, that two-factor authentication, to load the security settings page in an iframe. So that's why we, don't sh we shouldn't allow uh, your website from being iframed from your own website. Um, so they load the security settings and they set the requesting two-factor authentications to none, to never. So, uh, basically, you are just downgrading security in the website. So one thing, one thing that was weird is that this iframe was not invisible, which is one of the indications that we have that the attack wasn't complete. So they were probably still working on the attack. They were debugging and seeing how it goes. So after this, um, if you try to go to the security settings page, you are presented with a, a one-line error saying you that something went wrong, uh, please try again later. And this is presently what it, uh, what it does. What it could do, it could initiate uh, a transaction for an, a, a, a wallet controlled by the attacker and it would be easy because after disabling two-factor authentication, there was nothing there to stop the attacker from doing this. And the account wasn't frozen, so it could be done immediately. All your funds are lost. And this is far too appealing because uh, you cannot undo this and the money is untraceable. So why shouldn't many of the browser Trojans target uh, crypto exchanges? They should. It's easier than targeting a, a, a conventional bank in my opinion. So this is how we implemented the attack. So we deployed a burp proxy and the burp proxy is doing, is applying the web injects, but it's also stripping the CSP and the X-frame options headers. And why we are doing this? Because we believe that after the attack, Coinbase uh, disabled the fr uh, framing within their website and this attack in particular is using the iframe, as I told you. So in order to replicate how it, w how it worked, we are stripping the headers. Uh, and by the way, Coinbase, like I said, is the only exchange that, that is presently doing this. Uh, all the others are still vulnerable to this type of, of uh, iframing. So obviously we configured uh, a browser to use the proxy. And the JavaScript payload is communicating with a C2 that we have implemented. So now it's time for the demo. So here in Burp, you can see that we are um, removing the um, removing replace with nothing the X-frame options headers and content security policy. And we are also adding the web inject. So let me try to show you that. So before you couldn't see very well, but this is the same as I've shown you before. It's uh, obfuscated, but uh, its obfuscation is really simple. So in, in five minutes or so, you can, you can reverse this not really a good barrier. 
Okay, so we are already um, running our C2. So let's head to So the window is, is not very big, so I'll try to do this the best I can. Okay. So let's go to Coinbase. This is not, it thinks it's in a mobile device because it's a really short. Okay, log in. So right now, it's already tampering with the web page. So this sign in button will exfiltrate the credentials. So I need to use the two-factor authentication running in my mobile device and verify it. So here is the model that's injecting into the web page. You're probably trying to log in from a new location. And if we go to the security settings, so, sorry. Something went wrong. Let me just try again. <coughs> okay. So it's now requesting my two factor authentication tokens again. So this is fake. Of course. Let me just use my mobile device. Four, two, one, five. In the original attack, it would show the iframe. So in this case, we have disabled it because it wouldn't be. It's hard to understand what's going on if you are seeing an iframe. And now if you go to the settings, you see this error. So something went wrong. Please try again, again later. Okay. So this is the attack. And what they aren't doing is transferring the funds out, but they could easily do that. If we go, if we log in using another browser which is not using the burp proxy we can confirm Okay, so we can confirm that right now the security settings, the two-factor authentication is disabled. So we can see this because we are not using the infected browser, but uh, if we try to use uh, Firefox in this case, we are not allowed to see the settings or even change them. Let's, because we are at DEF CON, we should fix this immediately. Right? Okay. Okay, so what have we learned by doing this? So first, the first conclusion is that this attack is very noisy. 
So it basically injects the web inject in every endpoint of the website. So if they were trying to be quiet, they shouldn't do that. They should target like two or three very specific URLs and only drop the web inject in those endpoints. But uh, we can speculate. Because the attack was still being designed. Maybe the guy doesn't know yet which endpoints that he will use. So he doesn't want to lose the, an opportunity to tamper in other pages of and maybe Coinbase can change the endpoints as well. So he wants to uh, retain the ability of just tamper with any uh, inner uh, URL. It also uses a state machine to control how it works. Uh, but it seems very experimental, very poor, poorly written JavaScript. Uh, I believe it's uncompleted work and we have uh, different um, signs that this is true, like the visible iframe. Also, there's a part in the, in the payload where they are doing the, the transferring out the funds, but uh, you have a return statement just at the top of that function. So it's an unconditional return statement. So it means that they are disabling that part. And, and we also saw that some uh, automata uh, states are missing from, from the code, seem to be missing. So two-factor authentication or SMS confirmation, uh, it's not a real barrier for this attack vector. And, and I believe that even security professionals can be tricked because it's, uh, it's so confusing when and when not uh, two-factor authentication uh, is, used or, or is used or should be used or why it's used. So it's, you can easily be tricked with this. And uh, we assume that in this case, Coinbase has since disabled the, the, the iframing uh, from within their website. So obviously you can follow the usual many of the browser recommendations, like using uh, a live distro to go to your favorite banking website or crypto exchanges. But I mean, uh, that's hurting the usability even more, right? So. Um, so the question is, what if we w could be able to uh, detect the injections and do something about it? And this is the, the question that we have been trying to, that we have been working on uh, lately. So this is one, two. OK. So this, the, this is what we came with, uh, application real-time monitoring. And this is more or less how it works. So it has two components, a client and a server. And the client component, the real-time monitoring agent, is continuously monitoring the page and the DOM. Uh, and it checks for DOM injections, for JavaScript uh, script uh, injections, and for modified event handlers. And it does that by leveraging mutation of servers to receive, to receive a stream of uh, things that have been changed in the DOM in real time. Uh, it also combines that with the uh, checksums for certain parts of the, of the DOM. And it does poisoning injection. So when the injections are detected, we send that out to the real time monitoring backend which validates if this is a real threat, and then it sends out to the backend application using a special webhook. So this webhook is receiving a stream of events, of things that are being injected into the application, and this is done in real time. And you can set policies on your application backend on how to react to this. So you can, you can uh, blacklist the user, uh, uh, automatically uh, freeze the account. You can do a lot of things. And it can be done in timely fashion in order to stop funds from being exfiltrated from the account. So you can send more, you can ship more, more things to the clients as a, a feedback loop. And, and, and this can be really helpful. So it follows a white listing approach, means that it detects any unseen uh, injections. It has different levels of sensitivity according to what's being injected and where. And it uses machine learning to tackle the false positives. 
also supports signatures uh, so for known injections, in which case it can launch countermeasures. So it can remove injections that uh, we already knew about, but it can also re redirect the page to a certain URL, delete cookies, or execute a custom callback in the client side. So this is, is very flexible. Of course, all of this is uh, done uh, by using code protection because the, the client side component is JavaScript, can also be tampered with. So it needs to be resilient to any kind of uh, uh, manipulation from the web inject. So it uses polymorphic JavaScript obfuscation, it is tamper resistant and can optionally be mixed with the code of the application making it very hard to distinguish which part is the agent and which part is the regular code of the application. So let's redo the, the demo, but this time uh, using the application real-time monitoring. So I'll, I'll struggle a little bit with the size of the windows, but I'll try to do my best. In order to add the agent, I'm also using burp proxy. So this, this part is adding the agent to every web page dynamically because we, we couldn't get Coinbase to install it in time for this talk. Sorry. <laughs> and, and let's go here again. And let me open the, the dashboard here. Okay, so I, I want you to be able to at least see a, a portion of this uh, graphic in the back. So I'm, I will try to position things so that you can see a little bit to see what happens. Okay? So I have to restart C2. Okay, we're done. Let's go. So we are already seeing things in the back. Just a second. Already seeing things. So we have four new threats, so things are getting, are landing in the, so we can see the button here, and you can see the overlaid button code here. So you could already be doing something about this. Right. Let's proceed. This is the regular two-factor authentication that Coinbase requests. So the, here you can see the iframe. So sometimes the code isn't, isn't really reliable. So as I said, it's a work in progress and may take a long time to just move over. Okay, and we have new stuff. All the time they are adding the web inject to, to the page and deciding whether they should do something or just quit. When they decide to do nothing, they also remove the injection from the web page. So if you, if you do a dump at a later stage of the DOM, you won't find the injection there. Okay, so this seems to be stuck. Let me try again. Bear with me, please. Of course. Sure. So, 
Yeah, good question. So burp is replacing me having my device infected. So if I, so if I had my device infected, my browser would be in control of the web inject. And as you go to Coinbase, it automatically injects uh, the. Yes, I know. I know. We we have shown you before. I, I can I can show you in the end if that's all right. Okay. I can show you again. So let me try this again. All right. Seems to only work at the second time. Shit. Okay, so you've seen this before. Let's see what we have here. We have quite a few injections in the page. Let me try to show you uh, a couple that might be interesting for you to see and to understand what, what kind of information we can supply. So here you can see this is a form and it's actually the two-factor uh, authentication uh, thingy where it's requested, like the model, complete model, having the, the form to request the two-factor authentication. And let's see another. Okay, so this one is in the dashboard and it presents an image. Let me see what kind of image. This is it. So this is the icon that shows just next to the two-factor authentication. I don't know if you remember, but this is the kind of thing that you can collect as well. All right. So let us go to the security settings. No, I'm in the wrong browser. <laughs> Okay, load the security settings. Something went wrong, please try again later. Okay, so four new threats. This is all live. And we can see that a bunch of DOM has just been removed from the security settings page. And this is the actual uh, cont security controls that you usually see in the page. They have been removed and the attacker has placed the error message. Okay, so. So in conclusion, uh, if there's anything I'd like you to, to take away from this talk is that uh, crypto exchanges are being targeted by many of the browser and they should beware of, of, of this attack vector. Uh, of course, every other vector should be in their uh, horizon as well. Um, but I believe we are seeing more of this because it's far too appealing for an attacker because it's anonymous, it's untraceable, and if they get out, it's uh, really difficult to, to find out who, who's, who stole the, the money. So I, I think this, this uh, attacks against Coinbase and blockchain info uh, can be seen as warnings. Uh, because the, the work, after all, was uh, incomplete. We don't know if there were consequences. Um, we know that the credentials could have been stolen during this period, so we, we don't know if someone is using, using them in any way. Uh, but we know that at least this version of the Trojan is not yet stealing money. Um, and other conclusion is that two-factor authentication uh, is not enough for this attack vector. So definitely exchanges can improve their defenses, things like temporarily freezing the account when you change anything about the security of your account. And, and I don't mind paying with usability, but at least do it right and don't, don't provide workarounds for people to just go and disable two-factor authentication uh, because this can also uh, be a tool for uh, web injects and for Trojans 
to, to be able to, to perform their attack. So I think the attacks will most likely get more creative and, um, and they can be executed by anyone. Because you can acquire a Trojan kit in the black market. You don't need to really understand how it works. You just need to write some JavaScript that goes into a web page and adds stuff to the DOM, removes others, and implements a state machine to control how you are doing that. So it's not really sophisticated, it's really simple, and due to the potential returns, uh, I think we're definitely seeing more stuff. I think for this attack vector, application real-time monitoring is, is really, uh, can be effective. Uh, we just assume that injections will occur, we cannot prevent that, and try to detect them in real time when they do. Uh, you can set custom policies, you can adapt what you're doing in real time, and you can mitigate the attacks before they are successful. Uh, and uh, as you know, if attacks keep failing, uh, probably the attackers will move to the next site because they always look for the least amount of effort and the maximum profits they can have. So I cannot tell you exactly how to earn money using this talk, uh, like Ming said, uh, because I shouldn't, uh, unless you pay me a beer afterwards. Uh, then I can consider that. <laughs> so this is all I have. Thank you.